of you and your riddles, your supreme arrogance. Don't you ever, ever enter my life again. Do you hear me? Ugh. Man, this job can be a real pain in the ass sometimes. Like, one day you're writing about a bonafide masterpiece like Dune Part 2, more on that soon, and the next, you're stuck trying to figure out what to say about a piece of corporate trash like Madam Web. I mean, where the hell do I even start? I don't think anyone who saw this movie, all seven of us, was under any illusions that it was going to be good in a conventional sense, aside from giving us one of the more perplexing line reads in recent memory. He was in the Amazon with my mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. The trailer was bad in an utterly unremarkable way and inspired little confidence that Sony had finally figured out how to make one of these Spider-Man without Spider-Man spinoffs work as anything more than a funny curio to watch while you knock back a few brews with the boys. The question on everyone's minds wasn't whether the film could exceed our extremely low expectations and wind up being legitimately good, but rather whether it would be bad enough to be entertaining in a so bad it's good kind of way. And the answer is kind of? I mean, make no mistake, this is a bad movie, folks. Like, really bad. At times, the story meanders from scene to scene with seemingly no momentum or internal logic, while broadly drawn caricatures of human beings spout inane, exposition-laden dialogue that borders on porn parody levels of cheese, and the film has clearly been reworked so much in post-production that you're never quite clear where in the film you're currently at. But those are all pretty basic bad movie tropes. Madam Web isn't just bad because it's a mess, it's bad for the utter cynicism that pervades every single frame. Like, we've all seen bad movies before, but usually you can at least tell that the folks involved believed in what they were making. Take The Room, for example. It's an infamously bad movie, but there's discernible passion there. It's earnest, and that earnestness almost makes it endearing. You can't be mad at The Room or anyone involved in it because their intentions are so clearly pure. The skill needed to make the thing work wasn't there, and there's an awful lot of delusion on display, primarily from the lead actor slash director slash writer Tommy Wiseau. But it's ultimately pretty harmless. But Madam Web exists on almost the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It's bad in a deeply insincere way. A film born not from a desire to make a good film, or even from the desire to make a film at all, but rather it feels motivated by nothing more than shameless greed intended to wring any remaining value out of a piece of intellectual property by a studio that has already pushed that IP well beyond its limits. Like Venom and Morbius before it, Madam Web is yet another Sony Spider-Man spin-off that attempts to turn the world of Spider-Man into its own cinematic universe, plucking an ancillary character from the comics with, uh, limited dimension to say the least, and trying to launch a franchise off of their mere association to the wall crawler. And the cynicism is all over the film, from the way it awkwardly shoehorns in supporting characters from Spider-Man lore like Uncle Ben, who is inexplicably BFFs with our protagonist, Cassandra Webb, to weaving an entire mythos around the spiders that give Madame Webb her powers and will presumably wind up giving Peter Parker his powers too. It's a film almost completely devoid of substance. It has nothing to say beyond Hey, do you like Spider-Man? These characters are all connected to him. Isn't that cool? Don't you want to go see more movies about all these cool spider people? It rules! All in all, it's a grotesque exercise in corporate greed built upon a premise that is so self-evidently faulty that it's hard to even understand the unholy line of thought that led to its creation. Every single problem with the film, from its embarrassingly incompetent ADR to its unnatural dialogue, can be traced back to its original sin. You simply cannot build a house on sand. So why have I had so much trouble trying to figure out what to say about this film? It seems pretty cut and dry, right? No, the problem is, despite all of this, 
I kind of had a great time watching this movie. But first, while Sony has been thirsting for whatever they can squeeze out of the Spider-Man franchise, I have been thirsting for knowledge, and luckily my thirst can be quenched with this video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is the best way to learn math, data, science, and computer science in a fun and interactive way. You could feel connected to all of this, seeing how your future could improve with thousands of lessons Brilliant offers from basic to advanced topics with new lessons being added every month. You could have just been bit by a radioactive spider, maybe you just buried your Aunt May and got a divorce, you've been wearing the webs for so long. Brilliant has you covered. They customize their content to fit your needs so you can learn at your own pace. You may feel connected by Madame Webb's web, but you know what she'll still need? Someone who can help her juggle all the great responsibilities she's been bestowed with, like responding to a work text automatically. Or, I mean, you know, she's got that web, she's gotta fix some of the code of the web. Guys, I'm really trying to make the spider puns work here. It's just, you can learn coding with Brilliant is what I'm trying to say. You can bring that skill into the spider family with Brilliant's programming course. It'll get you thinking with code and designing simple programs to solve real world problems right away. So what are you waiting for? Drive your ambulance over to brilliant.org slash filmspeak. Y'all know it by now. You know I love Brilliant. You know that they're amazing. They offer a genuinely great service that you should be taking advantage of just like me because I mean I'm I'm an idiot I need to learn new skills I need <laughs> stuff like this I need to be better at math because I don't know how to tip when I go out to dinner so th th brilliant can help you with that too they, they will literally do everything just go to brilliant.org slash film speak to get started for free for 30 days and the first 200 of you to click the link and sign up get 20% off an annual plan so I mean I mean really this is all worth it. Like, seriously, guys, you need to be taking advantage of this. This is amazing. That's brilliant.org slash filmspeak for a 30-day free trial. The first 200 people to sign up get 20% off an annual plan. And thank you so much to Brilliant. As always, love them for sponsoring this video. Going into Madam Web, I fully expected it to be on the same level as Morbius, its immediate predecessor in the Sony's Spider-Man universe, which I guess is what we're calling this. In other words, I was expecting an extremely tedious movie that would be memed so much that it convinced people that the film itself was as entertaining as the jokes they were making about it. Just another, it's Morbin time, hashtag more damn web, you know damn right what I'm talking about. But that really isn't the case with Madam Web. While it has certainly generated its fair share of jokes mocking everything from its trailer and goofy tagline to specific moments that have leaked online, Madam Web isn't just buoyed by memes. You sit down and watch this movie in isolation and I guarantee you'll find something to laugh about. Unlike Morbius, a film that thinks it's the second coming of Batman Begins, and whose star treats every role like it's the next Oscar-winning drama, Madame Webb is blessed with this utterly insane juxtaposition of a self-serious movie whose star can't help but hide her contempt for the stupid shit she's made to do, which is why I would categorize Madame Webb as funny in a so bad it's good kind of way. And we can thank Dakota Johnson for that. Much like her webs, which if you haven't heard, connect them all. It's Johnson's performance that saves this film from being just another bland piece of Sony IP exploitation. If you've never seen her in interviews, please, do yourself a favor. Oh my god, she's incredible. Go watch a few because they're pure comedic gold. She comes across as someone aloof and blunt, delivering every word in a deadpan so flat that makes each interaction feel as though it's teetering on surrealism. She almost reminds me of a performance artist like Nathan Fielder where it's never clear where she's being serious or just taking the piss, and it's so amusing as a result. And she brings that exact same energy to her performance here. Dakota Johnson plays Cassie Webb like she's on The Office, reading absurd lines of dialogue with layers of self-awareness as if she's about to look directly at the camera and wink at you. It's as if she knows how awful the material she's working with is and is inviting us to laugh in her stead. It's not that she isn't committed to delivering a good performance or thinks she's above doing the film, although she definitely is, but rather that she realizes the only way to make this shit work is to play it as dispassionately as possible in a hope that elicits some laughter from the audience. And I'd be lying if I said 
it doesn't work. She gives some of the funniest line reads I've heard outside of an outright comedy in years, and even that is probably giving comedies the benefit of the doubt because they haven't really been too great as of late. Honestly, this is probably funnier than most comedies you're gonna see. The infamous researching spiders in the Amazon line isn't even in the final cut of the film, but it doesn't have to be because that's the energy Johnson brings to every single one of her lines. This blunt self-awareness contrasts perfectly against the earnestness of the other performances, namely those of Sidney Sweeney, Isabella Merced, and Celeste O'Connor as Julia Carpenter, Anya Corazon, and Maddie Franklin respectively. All three girls play their roles completely straight, and in a better movie, they probably could have crushed these parts, but here, they're more or less sounding boards for Dakota Johnson to bounce insane line reads off of, like one particularly ridiculous moment where Cassie calmly reasons with the girls she's basically kidnapped and is holding a hostage in the backseat of a taxi she's just stolen. Which, by the way, that taxi continues to be stolen property that Dakota Johnson just drives around throughout the rest of the film. She thinks that by removing the license plates, that'll let her get away with it. She drives to the airport with it to go to Peru, and then back from Peru to the airport, still driving the taxi. How? Literally... If she is this wanted person, how is she, one, going into the airport and managing to get out of the country, but then also managing to get back in the country and still have the stolen taxi? It's just, oh, this movie, it's a gift. This movie is a gift. But the girl's sincere confusion with all the shit going on in the taxi clashes with the wry knowingness of Johnson's tone, creating an unexpectedly hilarious moment. And the film is filled with weird little interactions like that that are elevated by Johnson's performance. Another seemingly less intentional source of comedy in the film is its brazen product placement and references to Spider-Man lore. Sony isn't a stranger to stuffing their films with branded products, including their own, but Madam Web might just be the most shameless example of it I have, quite frankly, ever seen. Weirdly, there's very little Sony product placement here, probably because the film is a 2003 period piece for reasons I'll get into in a moment, but what there is a shit ton of is Pepsi product placement. Ever wanted to see Uncle Ben enjoy an ice cold Mountain Dew? Dream no more. Or how about a scene where every can is turned to face the camera, including between shots from different angles, as if the can turned by its own volition to mug for the camera? I shit you not, the final battle of this film takes place on top of an old warehouse with a gigantic neon sign advertising, you guessed it, Pepsi Cola, and the villain meets his ultimate demise when he's crushed by the letter P from the sign. Pepsi killed the villain. This is product placement so on the nose, it would make Adam Sandler squeamish. The only thing missing from the finale was one of those heroes looking over the body and triumphantly proclaiming, Pepsi. Now that's what I like. When it's integrated into a moment like this, what is quite literally the emotional climax of the film, it almost starts to read like a parody. That almost certainly wasn't the intention, but it's so fucking absurd that it kind of transcends its tackiness and becomes hilarious. The same goes for all the little nods to Spider-Man lore. We've already mentioned that Uncle Ben is inexplicably a key supporting character in the film, but it's far from the only reference shoved in our faces. Not only is Ben Cassie's best friend and colleague, but his sister-in-law, Mary Parker, is also in the film, and a whole sequence is devoted to Cassie attending the baby shower for her unborn child, the yet unnamed Peter Parker. Which, I guess the reason the film is set in 2003, essentially leaving the door open for Sony to introduce Spider-Man into the film set in the present. We even get a little nod to Peter's deadbeat absentee father, Richard, who can't even be bothered to show up for the birth of his own son, in a moment that feels like a tease for a Richard Parker spy spinoff about his adventures abroad in Mumbai or Shanghai or wherever. Small aside, but Sony, please, for the love of God, stop trying to make the Parkers happen. They are so incredibly uninteresting, yet you've continually rammed them down our throats for over a decade now. Enough. 
please. The nadir of all of this fan service comes when the final act of the film coincides with Mary going into labor and giving birth to Peter Parker. Again, it's so blisteringly tactless that it becomes unintentionally hilarious. Like the final act revolving around getting Mary to the hospital to give birth to Spider-Man feels like a joke someone would make about a hacky prequel. Yet, here it is, played entirely straight, and you can't help but laugh. That's not even mentioning the mystical spider people in the Amazon. There didn't need to be so much lore about the spider powers. I actually really fucking hate that. It's some of the most confoundingly silly bullshit put into a film like this. Spider-Man doesn't work with a mythos like that. In fact, it actually ruins the character to some extent. It feels antithetical to everything the character stands for, and that isn't really Madam Web's fault, but it's perpetuating the problem in arguably the worst way. Ultimately, it's kind of the fault of its source material. There was a period of time when the comics tried to integrate these more mythological elements into lore, but it's mostly left the canon because people rejected it and they don't like when Peter is destined to become Spider-Man. In making him special, it takes away what makes Spider-Man special. It's the idea that anyone can wear the mask, anyone could be that hero. It's part of the reason the Spider-Verse films excel and why Across the Spider-Verse, specifically, is such an effective critique of the whole Spider-Messiah thing. But, an incredibly large but, if you're gonna do it, at the very least, don't then make it seem like Peter was always destined to become Spider-Man. The idea that his creation was a freak accident should be maintained regardless of whether the spider that bit him is tied to this crazy mythology or not. And that for me is the differentiating factor between whatever the hell Sony is currently doing here and The Amazing Spider-Man 2, in my opinion, of course. It boils down to the corporate greed that has overtaken the creation of true art in Hollywood. The IP has to come first, even if it doesn't make any sense. Even if you create a universe that is supposed to surround one character, the one person who is supposed to be your figurehead, and you don't show him at all. Sony's Spider-Man universe not having a Spider-Man isn't just a bad idea, isn't just incompetent, it is certifiably insane. It's like trying to handicap themselves in a basketball game just to see if they're really good enough to make it work. Newsflash, Columbia, you're not. There are characters like Venom who can get away with it because he's strong enough to carry a film on his own and Tom Hardy is infectious in the role. But then you have Madam Web, Craven the Hunter, or Morbius, characters that exist to support or directly attack Spider-Man. It's like trying to make a full meal out of a side dish. You kind of need to include the center of your universe, the main dish, Spider-Man, in these stories if you want them to work the way you envision. And if you don't want to use Spider-Man, or are contractually obligated not to use him because of your deal with Marvel Studios, let each character exist in their own genre films. And if they happen to somehow connect, cool, but don't prioritize that. We don't care as the audience anymore. Madam Web, psychological thriller, cool, we're in. Morbius horror film, sure, why not? Venom rom-com, well, they did do that perfectly in Venom Let There Be Carnage, so I guess they do have a handle on at least one of these things. But even if artists attempt to strike out and create their niche project in this larger universe, and it just doesn't happen to be good, the studio demands of a Spider-Man adjacent film basically force them into an action movie. The expectations set by the studio get thrust onto the audience by how they choose to market these things and the images they choose to promote. You wanna know why people were disappointed with Madam Web? Well, a lot of reasons, but the first one being that it's a really bad movie, but one of the biggest ones was that they were promised Spider-Women, Spider-Man-like characters kicking ass in costume only to get a handful of blink and you'll miss it shots that tease the film this one was promised to be. It's a prequel to a prequel that we'll never see at this point. What are we doing here, guys? Part of what I struggled with while trying to figure out how I felt about this film was the question of intent. 
I sincerely found the film entertaining, but it's kind of for reasons the filmmakers didn't intend, or at least everyone but Dakota Johnson didn't intend. And so part of my concern was driven by the fact that I didn't want to give such a cynically made film a free pass. Yes, the pee and Pepsi is crushing Ezekiel Sims, which, by, by the way, one of the worst villains in a comic book film ever. I mean, like, this guy makes Malekith look like the Joker. Do I really want to give the impression this film has merit as a piece of art when so much of what I found entertaining was the sheer artlessness? of it. Does framing these flaws as part of the fun I had watching it only justify what Sony clearly did to this film? It's a tough question, and I don't really have a good answer except to say that it's kind of hard to make a transparently bad film like this entertaining. Much like Dakota Johnson, I can't help but feel the filmmakers were making the most out of the shitty hand they were dealt. The premise of doing a Madam Web spin-off film is pretty fundamentally flawed, but you can see where it could have worked. Like, the idea of doing the film as a kind of teen slasher movie crossed with a detective story where the hero is trying to parse psychic clues to solve a crime that hasn't yet been committed in the hopes of stopping it. That's cool. And there are moments of this film that feel like that might have been someone's vision for the project. Whether it be the writers or director S.J. Clarkson's, who herself has a writing credit on the film. It'd be easy to look at this disaster of a film and chalk it up to hack filmmakers turning out a product for their corporate overlords, but these people have made good things in the past. While writers Matt Sazma and Burke Sharpless have been involved in <laughs> some less than great projects, like Morbius to say the least, They've also written stuff that I genuinely like, like the surprisingly solid 2017 Power Rangers, a film that isn't amazing, but I enjoyed for the most part, and the Lost in Space revival on Netflix, which they were showrunners on, and that show was largely well received. They clearly have some level of talent, but screenwriting's a job, and a lot of the time, you just have to roll with the punches. You often don't have much of a choice in whether or not to incorporate the notes you're given by your bosses, and if ever there was a film that feels like a victim of studio notes, it's Adam Webb, a film so scattershot you can feel the quality shift on a scene-by-scene -scene basis. And while yeah, we can judge Sazma and Sharpless on their resume of pretty bad projects, look at Craig Mazin, the guy who wrote Movie 43, of all things, just an absolute abomination of cinema, and a lot of other really, really bad comedies. He did those films in order to get to where he is now in order to finally get a shot at making real art, which he did with HBO's Chernobyl and which he's currently doing with The Last of Us. He's a guy that most of you probably would have written off had it not been for Chernobyl and The Last of Us. And so, you know, who's to say the same can't be true for Sazma and Sharpless? It's just, I can't necessarily place the sole blame of things on their shoulders. And then there's S.J. Clarkson, an extremely talented director who has worked on some truly exceptional episodes of television for shows like Succession. Yeah, she did the Bachelor Party episode, the one that you all love. She's a great director, but she's also worked for Marvel Studios before on shows like Jessica Jones, The Defenders, and she directed episodes of House. So clearly, she knows what she's doing in a director's chair. This film is remarkably well shot for what it is, with some genuinely impressive location shooting in Massachusetts to replicate early 2000s New York City. I say this with absolute zero hyperbole, Clarkson manages to make New York City feel more tangible and alive in Madam Web than Marvel Studios has in any of their Spider-Man films, and that's entirely because of S.J. Clarkson. And while the editing is shockingly bad at points, there are moments where it's quite good, like the moment Cassie boards a train bound for upstate New York and begins having a number of disorienting visions of the future that slowly start to build on each other to provide her with a glimpse of an impending attack by Ezekiel Sims. Clarkson deftly weaves multiple takes of the same few seconds to place us in Cassie's mind as she experiences these clairvoyant episodes, allowing us to feel the disorientation she feels as she tries to piece together all the elements her vision is showing her to create a complete 
picture. Clarkson made a solid attempt at creating a strong visual identity for the film, even going so far as to use a split diopter and move it around to create the visual flashes for Madame Web in camera, as opposed to fully relying on CGI when it came to the clairvoyant stuff. See, let's call out the craft when it's there and apparent. It's really well done and totally at odds with how jarringly other parts of the film are edited. I can't help but walk away with the feeling that those were the result of last minute changes mandated by the studio. The most glaring example of this being the atrocious ADR for almost all of Ezekiel Sims's lines. Oh baby, what the hell. There are moments where his lips very obviously don't line up with the words he's saying, while Another significant portion of his lines are spoken off screen while the camera awkwardly lingers on the person he's speaking to. I have absolutely no idea why his lines were dubbed over because some of them do still sync with his lips, but whatever the reason, whether it was line changes, which honestly I feel like goes beyond line changes, it really just goes to changing every single piece of dialogue the villain has, or maybe it was something to do with Tahar Rahim's performance, it feels like a rush job by a production working on revisions right down to the last minute. It's for all these reasons that I find it hard to blame any of the filmmakers for the cynicism of the final product. Blame very clearly lies at the feet of Sony, who managed to get talented people who've proven they know how to make good things to work on their misbegotten Spider-Man spinoff and then still couldn't resist putting their grubby little hands all over the film, cramming it with embarrassing product placement and fan service, and massacring it in post. And it's for that reason, I don't feel so bad sitting back and enjoying this cinematic car crash for what it is. I mean, it's just kind of a disaster piece. Everyone involved in this film was evidently trying their hardest to make something worthwhile from a seriously shitty premise. There's something almost cosmically funny about the fact that every ill-conceived boardroom mandate in desperate spider-milking mistake backfires in the most spectacular way imaginable, turning what would otherwise be the absolute bottom of the cynical IP barrel dreck into an accidental diamond in the rough. Madam Web is funny. But it's funny because it's a bad idea that talented people could have made work, but was ultimately sabotaged by a studio that just doesn't know when to stop. If the production of Madame Web was a series of progressively worse decisions, then Sony's web connects them all. And oh boy, what a tangled web it is.